Now, using wildcard meta characters, and we do this in, in batch files, and it's very powerful. If I do ls, again, we see I didn't highlight it in yellow, but it's highlighted in blue. We see all of those files and, and folders, our directories. If I do ls project star, just by putting ls project star, I get project one, two, one, two, one, three, two, three, four, five. Does everyone see why I get all of those in the output? Anyone that doesn't? Good. <clears throat> if you don't own up, it just makes things more complicated later. If I say LS project with a question mark, I'm one wild character. So this time, when it goes project one, two, three, four, five, what's left out? Everything that had two after the word project, like one, two, one, three. Now here I'm doing two wildcard characters. Question mark, question mark, project, question mark. And this time I pick up one, two, and one, three. But I don't pick up the singles. So I have to have two characters. Now here I'm saying LS project, and what I'm looking for is something that has a one, a three, or a five as the last character. The bracket is what defines that. We good? <clears throat> All right. Down here I say LS project and this explanation point, one, three, five, and what I want to see is not one or three or five. So let's see, I got a two. There's no one in that. I got a project four. There's no one, three, or five in that. Good. Down here, it, an example of matching the desktop. If I say LS desk with two question marks and a P, what does that give me? What does that give me? Do what? <clears throat> Every file which desk two uh, two characters and P could be desk What does it give me? <clears throat> Anybody back there? Tell me, just describe to me what this would produce. Anything with eight characters to start with, they can have any letters in the six seven spot. It would be. I heard what you're saying. Say it louder. It's gonna bring like an eight character um, file name with uh, the six and seven spot it can be any characters. Don't get start with this. Get in with P. Everybody hear that? Give that man a cigar. Starts with D E S K, ends with a P, and you can have any character. Any two characters will satisfy. How about this one? Somebody tell me what this one does. Somebody new, of course. <clears throat> Nobody? Everybody good? What do you mean by OP? Do what? OP part. 
Well, it, it actually, what these are doing, if you had read this, is it's examples that will match desktop. desktop. So if we put D-E-S-K and it's T-O, we got T-O-P, right? If we have D-E-S-K, and what does this one do? It searches for something that matches anything from A to B. Correct. So anything from A to V, which would include T. All right. So just to clarify, anytime it, it's, it's going to um, only retrieve files that begin with desk and end with the P or OP. They they have to end with the yeah. with the last and first. Okay. All of this and this is fixed. <coughs> Okay, you know, it's non-negotiable. Okay. In here, that letter can be anything, or character, can be anything from the alphabet A to V, okay. which happens to include T. Here, it can be an E, a G, a D, or a T, which satisfies T. Okay. And here, it, two characters, which in this case would be T O. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Displaying content of a text file. We, you, you do type in Windows, T-Y-P-E, and you can also do echo, but anyhow, type will display what's in a text file. Of course, you're going to open it in Notepad and all that, but the command prompt, type, will do it. In Linux, cat will do it. It's really not correct to say that cat's just something that displays files. It's actually something that puts files together, to concatenates two or more files. However, when you tell it to cat a file and you don't give it, you give it the first file and you don't give it a second file, it will concatenate it with what's known as standard out. Does anyone in here know what that is? We're going to be covering it. Yeah? Like the source code looking thing that would be what's transmitted? <clears throat> it's a screen. Standard output is your, your teletype or your tube. So if I said cat file one and didn't say file two to connect them, then it would automatically say cat file one and send it to the display. We'll see that. <clears throat> okay, cat-n project four. And we come down here, and this is the contents of project four. Hi there, I hope this day <coughs> finds you well. Well, what I want you to see down here, I'm saying cat-n means number it. It doesn't have these numbers normally. Project four, so down at the bottom it says regards McKenzie. Okay, if I say TAC, and, and um, Linux does this quite a bit, it happens to be CAP backwards. So if I say TAC, displays the contents of the text file in reverse order. So when I do the TAC project for, like the CAT, starts out with the last line and regards, and then, you know, right on up. <clears throat> Okay, we look at some concatenation examples here. If I make a directory, cat-dir, and then I cd to that directory, the directory is empty, correct? Correct. Now, if I do an ls, I don't on cat-dir. I, I, if I just do an ls, I'm in that directory. Nothing comes back. <clears throat> Now, if I type echo, this is a file one, or quote, this is a file one, and I, that little arrow, and I point it to file one. Then when I say ls, notice file one now exists. Now, 
we, I need you to understand that before we go any further. Everybody understand how I created a file? You just use the right arrow? Yeah. <clears throat> if, you, if you type echo hello on your computer on the command line in Windows, what happens? Say it loud. It shows you hello. It says hello on the screen. Is that what it does? That's what it does. It echoes hello on the screen. Now, if you type echo, hello, and then you put a little greater than, and you said file one, will it echo on the screen? No. But what it'll do is create file one right there on your windows. Okay? So I said echo, this is file one instead of hello, and I redirected it into file one. And then when I do ls, unlike this one where it's empty, see file one right there? Okay, I'm gonna take that as we're good. Yes, no, further explanation. All right, now if I do a cat file one, and I, this red standard out is me writing on this, that's not part of the command. When I say cat file one, it sends it to standard out. It, this is what it looks like. This is file one, because that's what I put in it. We're good? <clears throat> now I go echo, quote, this is file two, quote, and I redirected it into file two, just doing the same thing, all right? Then I say ls, and now I got file one and file two, all right? <clears throat> this time when I say cat file two, it comes back and tells me what I put in file two, big deal. Now, getting a little more complicated, when I say cat, file one, file two, it displays the contents of file one and file two on the screen. Good? When I say cat, file one, file two, redirected into file three, nothing comes back on the screen. And if I do an ls, I see now I have file one, file two, and file three. If I say cat, file three, what do you think's in it? This and this. We're good on that? Is, file, is the contents of file one and file two just copied into file three, or is it completely removed from file one and two? No, it's just copied. It just copied, okay. Good question. The contents is copied from file one into, and file two into another file. It doesn't alter the source file. Your head command, uh, head dash three, if I type that, I'm going to see the first three, the head of the file, the first three lines. If I do a tail dash two, project four, I'll see the last four lines. The more command, same in Microsoft uses it. If you type more, it's going to display a long file page at a time. You can use the space bar for a page or the uh, return bar for a line. The less command is the same as the more command, but can also use a cursor to, to scroll it. <clears throat> okay, strings. <clears throat> String command searches for displays, searches for and displays text characters in a binary file. If you're actually a Linux administrator, you'll do this kind of thing all the time. A binary file, <clears throat> such as a program, and the, the echo that we were using, that's, a, that's an actual binary file. It executes when you type echo. It's usually not printable, but it can have printable characters and strings in it. So if I took and typed strings on Ben Echo, and then I piped it to the more command we were talking about, because it's going to flood, 
Well, it comes back and it shows me anything that can be printed. Try LS for help and all that. So that's what the strings command does. The OD command displays contents of a file in octal format. I'm not sure why you would ever want to use that. Uh, base 8. Uh, the X displays the file in hexadecimal. You wouldn't necessarily want to do it, but in forensics, you do want to do it all the time. OD Project 4, with now piping it, meaning send that output to head, and I want to see five lines. Well, it's doing octal, so it's showing me the octal numbers of whatever's in that file. Okay, regular expressions. This is page 108, regex. <clears throat> These are used for searching. And here are some of your hooks that you can put in there. <clears throat> now, if you do a grip command, anybody heard of grip? One, okay. If you do a grip command, you're actually going to be searching for content. So if I say grip Algonquin Park, that's under the quotes, then I put project four. That means I want you, <clears throat> I want to search Algonquin. I mean, search project four for Algonquin Park. And it comes back and it shows me two lines in that file that have that word in it. Okay? Or those two words. Now, here I'm saying grip Algonquin Park project four, and, and notice I get nothing back. Why is that? Because it's case sensitive. So, if I go grip dash I, which means ignore case, and lower case I'll go on Queen Park, I get them both. Okay. Here, when we say grip quote we project four, notice I get two hits. This is very important though. <clears throat> I mean the difference if you're doing a test successfully too. The word we, think about the word we. The word we only happens if you have a space, a W, an E, and what? Another space. A space. That makes the word we. So really, this is a false hit because it, it well is not we. So if I wanted to be specific, I could say grip, quote, and there's a space here, W-E space, and then it will only give me the we. We're good. <clears throat> e grip is for extensive uh, use. It's uh, if I do an E grip. EGRIP can be used for logical uh, um, searching. In the EGRIP command, when I say lodge and this pipe right here, lake, I'm saying lodge or lake. So I get lake in one line and I'll get lodge in the other. So I'm saying grip, lodge or lake. Here is the VI editor. Anybody in here use the VI editor? You're going to love it. <clears throat> My advice is to make a copy of what you're editing so when you get it really screwed up, <clears throat> you'll have a copy to back up on. It is not user friendly. So why do we want to use it? Well, it's in all every Unix or Linux distribution. So it's going to be there even if you don't have anything fancy writing on top of it. Vim is the Linux equivalent of Unix VI. So uh, standard on most Linux distros. And here's some of the commands. And you'll be doing some of that. Okay, other command text editors. If you've got a desktop running on your Linux distro, you'll, you may be able to use nano editor. We'll use gedit in this class. So we will be going back and forth in the GUI. Uh, actually, it's functionally analogous that G edit to word pattern notepad. 
You have three labs tonight. <clears throat> the class, as I said before, we have three the first week, three the second week, two after the third week, two the fourth week, one, 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 like that, so it gives you time to get caught up. Any questions? project files and start deleting whatever's in there. It can be a real pain because there may be some subfolders of subfolders of subfolders and I'm interested in just blowing away everything in that folder. So if I am I can type remove dash force and recursively dash r. Boom. It'll just go right on down it so you see it's gone. And it didn't ask you anything else, just did it. Okay, finding files. The locate command looks uh, in a pre-made database that contains a list of all the files on the system. So if I said locate the file init tab, then it will come back and say it's in accept init tab, it's in user share man init tab, it's in user share vim init tab, be, and that is because there has been a pre-populated database of files on the system. Windows has a, a similar function called indexing. Uh, <clears throat> it's a lot of overhead. It may still exist even if it's not in that database, so maybe you might need to update the database if you're going to use the locate command. The database used for locate command is right here and you need to update the DB if you can't find it that way. Now the find command you will use quite a bit. <clears throat> the find command can recursively search for files starting from a specified directory. Find, start directory and all that. So find slash name project. Let's look at it in action. If you say find slash, <clears throat> that's going to start finding files right from the get-go, right from the root of the file system. There isn't anything above that. It'll start right there, and it will start finding files. And by the way, you have to be root to do that. If you say find dot, and then I'm looking for dash name project, so I'm looking for file project. I'm looking for it in my current directory, the dot, okay? And if I say find slash root, I'm saying go to slash root and see if the file named sample file is located in there, okay? <clears throat> so here it is in, in action. Find slash exit slash dash name init tab. So what I'm asking, is there an accept init tab? And yes, there is. Here, if I say find slash accept dash name host with an asterisk, quotes and an asterisk, we see a host with a S, host, 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 and host, okay? Now, path variable list directories on systems where executable files are located. You got a pass statement. If you typed in your command prompt right now and entered P-A-T-H, it will show you the paths in your windows. And really what the path is, it's how the system finds executable files. I'm sure you've heard put it in your path statement. That's what they're talking about. <clears throat> so here path is a variable and if we put dollar in front of it and we say echo dollar path then it's going to go and show us what all is in that path variable 
and here are all the files that are in it. And if you'll notice, they're, they're bins. These are binary files, and that's what they mean by executable. Linux, they're, they're binary files. So, <clears throat> so we got here user Kerberos sbin, and so on. Now the which command, it searches directories listed in the, in the path variable for an executable file. So if I, if I say which, <coughs> excuse me, grep, well it'll come back and it'll say it's in bin slash grep. <coughs> trying to see if he's looking at his cell phone or he's asleep. Oh. <laughs> anyhow. anyhow. <coughs> Sorry, I'm boring you. Hold on. <laughs> if the file being searched does not exist in the path variable directories, like which grepper, grepper doesn't exist, it'll come back and say no grepper in so and so. All right, file system. We have a super block. It contains the general information about the file system, number of inodes, and data block size. We have an inode table. Uh, if you were doing forensics, this would be very important. If you're not, <clears throat> maybe it's just information you need to know. Data blocks, data making up, contents in the file, and symbolic links and hard links. You do need to know about these, and we're going to try and make them clear. <clears throat> hard link files, <clears throat> just like, uh, has anybody created a shortcut in Windows? Hard links and soft links are like shortcuts, but they're, they're not exactly both. <clears throat> so, when I said a second ago that all files have an inode, that's an, actually a number. The computer doesn't care that it's file one. It, it's 1204 for the computer. That's the inode, and it has a lot of information in 1204 about file one. But here's the inode, and I'm, symbolically I'm drawing you the data that resides in the system for that inode file one. Now, if I'm going to do a hard link, then with file two, then really what I'm doing is they share, they'll, those two files will share the same inode I know 1204 for file one, I know 1204 for file two, and the data block are the same. Pictorially, this is what I've, it looks like. I did a little picture of it. You have the original file right there, points to the data on the disk. The hard link points to that data on the list too. They are, in fact, the same identical file and data, hard linked. They have different names. And different people can be given permission to update that same file, depending on your organization. We good? All right, here's your <clears throat> an example here. To make a hard link to a file and call the new hard link file to, I'll do an ls-l, and when I do that, I'm getting the long listing. We see here that there is link count of one for file one. Now, if I type in <coughs> link file one to file two, notice we've got file one, we don't have a file two. I say link file one to file two, then I do an ls, now we got file one, and it has two links. We have a file two. It has two in the link. And notice the size of the file. They're identical. They're pointing to the same data on the disk, actually. Did, did that create a file two right there mm -hmm. as a copy of file one? Nope. No? Nope. It just pointed this file two, the name, 
in the same I note as <clears throat> as this one. And I'm sure I'm gonna show you right here. When you look at file one and do when you do an L S dash L and put the little I after it, it shows you the actual I node <coughs> number for the file. And it happens to be twelve oh four. File one's I node is twelve oh four. So is file two. They're talking about the same bit of data on the on the disk drive. And they would be updated, updating the same bit of data. We're good? Okay, now, I'm going to go into Microsoft a little bit here. Symbolic link files. They do not share the same inode and inode number. And with their target, uh, with their target file. Symbolic link file is a pointer to a target file. Data block dash data blocks in the link file contain only a path name for the target file. So if we look right here, we've got a file called slash home file three. File three is resident in the slash home folder or directory. File three has an inode number of 17440 and it has a data block for file three, whatever's in the data, however much. We good? Now if I have a create a symbolic link called file four, or a shortcut, however you want to put it, file four, then the inode number for file four is one nine nine two six different. But what's in the data field for file four is nothing but a pointer to the data field of file three. That makes sense? Yes? No? Yes? Yes. Yes. So, so the, you say you say yes. Good. Huh? Um, so the inode um, for file four there would just be because it's only pointing to the inode for file three. It would be a lot less. Um, it would have a lot less data to define itself in the system. As a, matter, or, yeah. as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you an example. The only data in it is, that is file five bytes. And I'll show you why. If, in this case, the link command, and I'm doing a symbolic link, dash S, so I'll symbolically link file three with file four. Now, notice in our links, here's file three, and here's file four, which is pointing to file three. And you see it in the printout. Notice I don't have a one real hard link to either one of those. Now down here, if I go ls-f, we see that file four has the asterisk, so it's a symbolic link now. And if I do an ls-l inode, look at the inode, they're different, 17440 and 19926, that's different. But notice that file 3 has 1244 bytes in it. And file 4, which points to file 3, has exactly 5 bytes in it. Those bytes are the ASCII text file 3, F-I-L-E 3, and it's 5 bytes. So when you access file 4, you see the link to, to get to file 3. You're actually talking to file 3 when you do the manipulation of the data. That makes sense? So yeah. Sure. No. You're not counted anymore. Say so, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Now, I, in all seriousness, if you don't understand, say so. <clears throat> if you don't care, say so. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Primary group, user default group. During the file director creation, file owner and group owner set the username and primary group. <clears throat> okay, who am I? That's the command to view the current username. So if I go, who am I, it tells me I'm root. 
groups command, I can view the group membership and primary group. Okay, groups, I see student. Well, I'm logged in, as you can see, student, with a pound sign, that's a user. Over here, I'm root. If I type groups with my pound sign, if I type groups, root is my primary group. And these are the groups that root are, is a member of. Okay, the touch command. The touch command will create an empty file. If you just say touch file one, then do an ls, file one gets created. It has no data in it. It's zero because all you did was just create it. You can also use that command to update the timestamp on the files. So if your backup system is copying all these files, it can be touching them and changing the timestamps so that you know when it was backed up and the software will not try and back it up twice. The change owner command, and we can use the recursive with it. So that I, if I say change owner, user one, file one, <clears throat> then I say change owner recursively, user one, desktop. I'll do an ls-l. We now see that the directory and the file that I just did that to it belongs to user one, both. If I do an ls-l desktop, inside of the desktop folder are these files, and they are now owned by user one. Change group. Okay, this is the group. This is the owner. So change group system file one, change group recursively sys desktop. So what I did was I made the group sys for both of those, and I did it recursively, so it did it to all of the files within desktop. If you don't want to type all that in, you can change both the owner and the group at the same time by putting owner.group. So I can change owner, user1.root, and file one, change recursively, user1.root, and it accomplishes the same thing. Okay, these are the permissions for the Linux file system. They're complicated. If you don't understand, stop me. User permissions, group permissions, and other. We have user, group, and other. That's what, when you do the ls command, that's what's over here on the left-hand side. And this D right here says this is a directory. So we got a user, group, and owner. And each one of them have a read permission, a write permission, and an execute permission. So we can see, <coughs> that this directory, which is owned by root, you can ha it has read, write, and execute. Root can do anything it wants to that directory. Now, if we go down to file one, Bob is the owner, and Bob can write that file. We're good? <clears throat> Or excuse me, user, <clears throat> read that file. Now, I'll see nothing else on that page. <clears throat> okay, you can change the mode of the command, meaning you can change these permissions <clears throat> using the change mod command. ls-l, we see here desktop and file one, and we see the permissions of file one owned by Bob read, write, and execute. If I want to change those permissions, I can say change mod, user gets a write, group gets a read and take the write away, other gets a read and take the execute away. So here's the results. Read, write, read, read. Good. 
Okay, I'm blowing it up to show you. If if you're good with binary, you don't have to use all those letters and others. You can actually use binary. Binary would be like RWX is 4 to 1. In binary, that's going to equal 7. 1, 2, and 4 added together. Good? Okay. 4, 2, plus 1 is 7. So I could call this permission 7 because they're all on. 7, they're all on. 7, they're all on. In my change mod command. <clears throat> That's just showing you <clears throat> so let's take some examples. I'm gonna <clears throat> I've got a read, uh, write, read, and read here. So I'm gonna say change mod user equals read write, group equals read, and <clears throat> other equals read. So on file two. There you go. Now I'm gonna change mod. If I want to do Every, if permissions to be changed are identical for all user groups and others, then I can just say A, <clears throat> all, plus execute. When I do that, it takes all three of them, other, user, and group, and makes, puts an X in their group to make them executable by using the all command. Now down here, if I say change mod <coughs> plus X on file two, it's going to add executable to each one, the owner, the group, and other. <clears throat> this is just breaking down the same thing I showed you here, a little bit <clears throat> bigger drawing, uh, 777. Change mod 540. Think about it, 540. Well, <clears throat> what is a 5? Go over here and we see it's 4 and a 1. Right? So that must be a read and an execute with the middle one zero. Five, four, O. Oh. The four is one is one, two, and four. And zero obviously is zero, zero, zero. Just no. Yep. Does anything happen when um, all three sections, user, group, and other, are already have an ex um, executable, for example, and you add executable to them all? No. That it just <coughs> wouldn't register. Okay. Keeps the same. Now, isn't it possible for there to be a write and an execute and not a read, or is there always going to be a read? Is it possible to? Is it because you're saying that? Five is read and execute. Four is just read. But is it possible that four could be write and execute? Because that would also equal four. <clears throat> or does there always it, have to be it, a read at least? Think about it. Wouldn't really equal four. If, how many? You got a. You're saying this, right? If you're talking about a write, here's a write. It's a two in the middle. Right. So it would have to be a read, a two, and a one. Think of it. Think of think of it like this. <clears throat> those three values represent those three permissions. Okay. And if there's a zero in that place, wherever it is in those three, it's off kind of really doesn't matter what the number is, just follow the zeros. We got a read, write, and an execute. Well, everything's on, there's no zero. Here we got a read and write, well there's a zero. That's read, write, and zero. Here we've got a read, and a zero in the middle, and an execute. And then down here, we've got a read, O, O. Right, yep. I just got confused, so thank you. Uh -huh. <coughs> It's new, you know, it's, it's more numeric permission values. Uh, to change the mode of all files in the directory, you can start with the word file, then 2644. 
So if we change mod 644 file star, we hit every one of those. Doesn't matter what it says, whether it's one, two, three, or four because of the star, and it changes all the permissions. Here, we've got a <clears throat> recursive option. So if I say change mod recursively, make them all 755 desktop, then when we do it, we got a 755, okay, <clears throat> for all of them. It's a little esoteric, but we're going to go ahead and do it. Your default permissions, whenever you create files in a directory, they're given default permissions. And they're given default permissions based on the UMask. And the UMask actually, the command displays or changes the UMask itself. The UMask, if we look at a default file, new files, by default are read write, read write, read write. New directories by default are read write, execute, read write, execute, read write, execute. That's the default values. However, the UMask on your computer alters that, your settings. And normally, the UMask would look like this, 0, 2, 2 for a file. Now, if you take the read write, read write, <coughs> read write, and here you apply 0, nothing changes. But here, the read write, you put a two in there, the right is gone. If you put a two here, the the right is gone. It's tricky. It masks masks out the value. It doesn't add to it. So I'm saying cover up the the two. So it says okay. Right's gone. On uh, here's an example. If I set the U mask to be 007. And <clears throat> then when I do a file, read, write, read, write, read, write, O, O, it doesn't bother the first two, and then it completely eliminates the group being able to read it, write it, or execute it. You don't want anybody in there but whatever group you want. Does the same, works the same way with the directories. It's called the UMask. And here, uh, you can keep these slides. I just expounded on what I just said by actually doing it. You mask, O, O, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> Can't accept shadow if we say permissions denied. You can become rude. You really should never just do general day-to-day -day stuff as root. Anybody know why? You can seriously mess things up on accident. Do what? You can mess things up. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. For one thing. Anything else? <clears throat> A lot of people use root to you know, do administrative functions and then they just stay there. <clears throat> well, if you get hacked as root, you can kiss it goodbye. Because now the hacker has root privileges to your entire system. If you log in and stay as a user until you need a root privilege command, then if you get hacked, the hacker can't do anything more than what a typical user can do. Well, that's a real pain, going back and logging in, logging out. That's why we have this thing called sudo and sudoers. If you open a root terminal and type <clears throat> vi sudo to access and edit this list, if you just try to make yourself, like here go, sudo cat except shadows, Ordinarily, <coughs> a typical user could never actually cat or view the except shadow file, which is all of your permissions. It has to be a root user to view that file. And when you type in sudo, <coughs> switch to 
root and cat this, it will come back and say sudo password for student. Well, you type in the root password, and then here it is, displays you the hashes in the file. But you had to put yourself in the sudoers file. It'll come back and tell you when you try, you just take your, your uh, Linux right now and type sudo ls, means try to run ls as a root user. It'll come back and tell you you're not in the sudoers. You can't sudo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> special permissions. You can uh, set the user ID, the group ID, and the sticky bit. You can change, you can change these functions. Uh, <coughs> what this actually says, the process owner for VI and ping commands executed by the user student in user mode. If you think about it, there are commands that you do that <coughs> When you're doing them, you all of a sudden have been elevated to root privilege. <clears throat> a ping command is a perfect example. You now are utilizing the network stack and everything on the computer. Or a mount command. You're actually manipulating the disk on the system. These <coughs> are commands that are normally above typical user. So what happens is you have to run as a root user while that's going on. So uh, <clears throat> the uh, SUID if set on a file, a user who executes the file becomes the owner of the file during execution. <clears throat> um, like ping and mount just during the execution. Now the set group and uh, applicable to files and directories, user who executes the file becomes a member of the files group for the moment and the SGID. So our sticky bit, uh, currently only applicable to directories but it ensures that a user can only delete his or her files when given right permissions to a directory. So when you're elevated for that period of time that you're not uh, a root, you can't destroy other people's files. And all this is telling you. What, what happens if you have multiple users that are on the same system and they try and run the same file that would give them ownership? <clears throat> if you have two people running ping on the same time. If they, they all have, if they all have permission to use it, they can, it's no problem. Is there just one owner though? Uh, no, they have to have access to it. Now, if they're, remember we've got owner, group, and other. Okay. okay. You, are you familiar with a Microsoft everyone group? Other? Okay. Same thing, yeah. <clears throat> but they're all sharing a common executable binary file but they, it's all moved into their terminal, <clears throat> if you will, and so they can access them at the, what appears to be simultaneously. Okay, <clears throat> all this is showing you is uh, when you do the SUID, if, if the execute permission is actually set, then you're going to see a capital S capital S and a capital T for the sticky bit. And if, it, <clears throat> if it's not set, you're going to see a, I mean a small S, you're going to see a capital S and a T. And uh, let's see, numeric representation of special permissions. They're special, they're out here. You don't even see them unless you specifically want to look at them. This is your typical three groups, user, group, and other. Special file permissions, uh, <clears throat> make a directory perm, and then I'll CD the perm. If I touch test and um, <clears throat> I'm concatenating, con change mod, zero, zero, test. What I did right here was I ran this command and that command at the same time because of that. Now when I did that, I do an ls, 
And notice that the permissions I gave this file that I just created are null. So now if I change the mod to 7000 test, then we can see that because they were not on in the previous slide, then I got capital SST. And down here I turned them on and you can see it's small SST. Just showing you that it happens. <clears throat> Special directories do the same thing. <clears throat> okay. The slash dev directory, device files. Inside of the dev directory, we have device files. Files rep representing a system device typically found in your slash dev. We can have character devices or block devices primarily. And your characters are like ASCII text. Your block devices are like for fast data transfer. This is character by character, byte by byte. This can be block transfer, CD-ROM, DVD, US, and flash. So here if I do an ls-l dev fdo, I'm looking at a floppy. I'm looking at the device file for a floppy. And here's all of your switches you can use. So we have a major number and a minor number, and then we have the type, blocker or character. So major number, minor number in the case particular device. So if I want to create one, or I have to put one back because it got clobbered, I would need to know these values. So here's an example where uh, I'll do an uh, ls on dev fd0, and it shows me that it's a block, and it's a floppy, and I got a 2 and a 0, and it is dev fd0. You have one in your uh, computer now. If I remove dev fd0 and then do an ls again, the file's gone. Now what I can do to put it back, I can say make node dev fd0 a block and a 2 and an O, and there it is. Now here I can use the dev make dev. If I don't really know those values, it will put the default values in there for me. Man. <clears throat> Let's see, mounting and mount points. I want to point this out. Mount points temporarily cover up the file folder or directory that you mounted to. So right here, if I if you type in mount, it's going to tell you that you have dev sda1 and so on. All of these are mounted. Now if I cat this file called except mtab, it will show me this as you will see. And all of these are the mount points when I boot up that give me these like for my uh, floppy disk and my hard disk, this is my hard disk, and my CD and so on. Now this tells you about the file system. <clears throat> now, f user dash u slash media floppy. When I did that, <clears throat> it came back and I said mount dash t, and then what I'm doing is saying I want to an extend to file system. I'm going to call it dev fd0, and I'm going to mount it at medium floppy. Then when I type mount, it's now mounted. So, the, and another example is the fs tab. If I cap the fs tab, it will show me all, this is showing me what will be mounted if I do an auto mount. Now if I mount dev fd0, when I type mount, it comes back and says, okay, you're mounted. And this is where it's important. I do a PWD, I am now in media floppy. When I try to do an unmount, the device is busy. 
<clears throat> in some cases useful info about processes that use the device. If I, it's busy, there is, it's mounted. Who has it mounted? You have it mounted. So you gotta unmount it, but you gotta get out of it before you can unmount it. Does that make sense? The floppy is unmounted. Uh, let's see, ISO 9000. I'm not going to spend all much time on burning CDs because you're not going to do it the hard way. You're going to download some CD burning software and do it that way if you wanted to do it on Linux to begin with. And <clears throat> so anyhow, any questions? Okay, I'm going to put your labs out there. And you're already on the time. Um, before anybody leaves, hold on for a second. Sorry, I don't want you to. Okay. In the second lab, I'm going to I'm going to provide you with a USB. It's just a little 128 megabyte USB. Use that. All right. What you're going to do is you're going to mount it and format it and do other things to it. All right. What I want to warn you about. I had students do this. If you're doing this stuff at home, ask me and I'll let you take one of these USBs, but don't do it on your own. Because once you've done it to your USB, your Microsoft data is gone because you will have formatted it as Linux and it doesn't go back. So I've had students go home fire up their computer and take their 64 gig, plug it in and do it, all right? You, you don't, don't do that, unless you don't care about it. the data. Okay. 